Okay, everyone, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, we are going to talk about security analytics. I would like to start with a little bit of introductions first. My name is Martin Zujek. I'm working for the technical marketing team as a senior architect. So I have a lot of experience with Citrix as a customer, partner, employee field consultant. And last few weeks, I started working more and more with security. So it's a lot of Citrix, a little bit of security. Today, I'm joined by my colleague, Pon Sarun, and he's pretty much the opposite of what I am. He has 20 years of experience only in security, working for companies like Cisco, and he joined Citrix recently. He's responsible for the security analytics as a product manager, and he has a little bit of knowledge about the Citrix. Now, I have one question that I would like to ask all of you here, and how many of you are professional threat hunters? Yeah, I never see any hands. So the way how we decided to do this session today is pretty much to talk to you about security analytics that is probably going to be used by someone else in your organization. It's going to be used by the security team. It's probably not going to be used by the Citrix teams. So what I would like to do first, I always like to do it in this, in this kind of sessions. I will do very short introduction to give you an idea what is the current state of cybersecurity in 2019 and why we are talking about security analytics, why it is important to know what you can do and how you can do it. I'm going to start by talking about the, what's currently happening with the cyber criminals. And usually when I do these sessions, I like to talk about how more professional they are becoming, how better organized, how we start, start seeing the, a lot of the state-sponsored attacks and so on. But today I decided I'm going to do it slightly differently. So I'm going to talk just the numbers. And the estimated annual revenue of the cybercrime, it's the annual revenue, is 1.5 trillion US dollars. This is the amount of money that is standing against you. Now the problem that I have here is that this number doesn't tell you anything because there are the big numbers, we are not really good at processing them. There is kind of ceiling and after that, it's just a big number. So I wanted to visualize this for you somehow. So what you are looking at, this is the stack of $100 bills. Together it's $10,000. For $10,000, you can have a lot of fun in Vegas. Now we are going to add some human elements so you can see kind of the references, what is the size. This is $1 million. For $1 million, you could buy the house in San Francisco. This is $1 billion. And by the way, the dimensions and everything, this is the real thing. So we actually spend a lot of time with calculating how this is going to look like. For $1 billion, you could reshoot every single Marvel movie from the phase one, including the Avengers. The combined budget for all of them was exactly $1 billion. Now, look at the guy on the left. Let's zoom out a little bit. So you can still see him in the corner. So the annual revenue of the cybercrime, and this is the guys that are standing against you, this is $1.5 trillion. This is what they are making in one year. So I'm not going to talk about how professional they are. I'm not going to talk about what kind of tools they are using. I'm just going to tell you this is everything they can throw and reinvest back against you. Now, standing in the opposite corner and you kind of have to realize that in the opposite corner of the cyber criminals, uh, it's not your security team. They don't want to fight your security team. What they want to find is the business. That's what they are going after, it's your business. And what we are seeing, pretty much all of us, is the assets that we have to protect are growing every single year. So. If you are working for all the company, you know that you have all the new and legacy systems that you have to secure. If your company has the culture of innovation, you are getting all the latest and new applications, so your portfolio of the software that you have to secure is actually growing as well. The best example that I like to use, and I could do the whole session only about this, is the IoT in enterprise. And as you can see, the next year, the estimate is that we are going to see about 30 billion devices. Now, I had a really nice chat with someone yesterday, and he told me, we don't use IoT at my company. 
that, that means you don't know that you are using it. You have some business units where someone will just buy some internet connected coffee maker or something, plug it in. It just means that you don't know that you have it. But I'm pretty certain that every larger company has some IoT devices on the network. Now, if you combine all of this together, the business is growing, the IoT devices, and this was pretty much the hardest number for me to find for this presentation. Average enterprise is generating around 200,000 security relevant events every single day. Log on, log off, anything that is security related. So now we've been talking about the attackers, the bad guys. We've been talking about the business. Who is standing between them and trying to protect them? Are your security teams. And the big problem that we have is the shortage of the cybersecurity professionals. And I like to do this kind of introduction to the current state of security every year. When I've done this in 2016, this number was 1.2 million. 2017, 1.5. 2018, 1.8. Current number that was released like a month ago is almost 3 million professionals that we are missing. And that's by far the biggest problem that we are facing in security today. We don't have people, we don't have the skills, we cannot pretty much keep up with the demand. And what you can say is that, okay, I can easily fix this. If I, if I don't have security people, I can just hire more. That's easy. The problem with that is that you are not the only one. So this is the number from the US, where we know that about 70% 70, 70 plus Companies are planning to expand security teams this year. So we have very limited pool of talents, and everyone wants to get them. And again, you can think, solution is easy, I just pay more. The problem is that this is not, you cannot easily fix this just with money, because the average salary in security is already very high. Once you start looking for the more senior people, like the lead security software engineer, the average salaries are, in many cases, higher than you pay for the CISO. So this is pretty much the definition of the problem that we have. And what are the current trends that we see in security? What's happening? Pretty much we know that this is the people that we have. This is the people that we need. How can we fill this gap if we cannot hire more people? First one is uh, heavy reliance on automation. So I was actually talking to a few large customers that are heavily involved, interested in security, and they told me the mandatory requirement that we have for security positions is Python and PowerShell. Security is optional. We can teach you security, but having the scripting skills, knowing how to do the automation, that's critical for us. Second thing that we are seeing, and this is again pretty much related to the limited resources that we have, is integration. So if you are a security expert, what you want to do is that you want to have one tool where you see everything that is happening. The security teams, pretty much for them, the SIM consoles, that's the one place they want to have. If you tell them we have all these applications, they are going to ask you, how can we get it into the SIM? If you offer them the standalone tool and you tell them we have five more dashboards where you can find the data, that's definitely not what they want to do because they don't have, again, people, they don't have time. Now, the last important one is augmentation. So if I know that I need 15 people in my security team and I have five, are there any technologies that can make my security people more productive? Are there any technologies that I can make them work as if there are 15 people? So how many of you went to the Black Hat or RSA or one of the big security conferences? Oh, I'm surprised. Now, if you go to these big security conferences and you go, for example, to the Expo Hall, every single vendor is going to talk about AI and machine learning. The reason why we do this is that we know we don't have people here, so what if we replace them with something that can potentially replace humans? That's why you see all the talk about AI and everything. Today, it's mostly marketing. So the result of all of this is, I, I can kind of summarize the whole state into the following statement. 93% of the security teams are overwhelmed and they are unable to triage the threats. 
Many of them, they just never investigate and they just ignore and hope that it's not going to result in the security breach. Now, what's the $3.9 million question? And if you are wondering what this number is, this is the average cost of security breach in the US. So what are the questions that security teams are trying to solve, aside from where do we hire more, more people from? How can we secure all applications? If I have 2,000 applications, I don't want to invent the security control for each one of them. I want to have something that I can apply easily to old and new application for the web-based SaaS applications, Windows applications, everything that I have. Second question is, how can I take all these uh, events from all the applications and data that I have, and how can I bring them into the single SIM solution that I'm using? The last big question is, so let's say that you have, okay, th this is a real example from the company that I used to work for. What if I have 8,000 applications and I bring the data from all of them into the SIM and I have five security guys? If I start generating five million events every single day, that's completely useless. If I have uh, one person false positives out of five million, that, that definitely doesn't work. So the third big question that the security teams are going to ask is, how can I reduce the number of incoming events? How can I analyze them? How can I focus only on the real important stuff? So before I'm going to hand this over to the uh, real security expert in the room, to Pons, pretty much the way how I would summarize this opening is following. You are experts on the data and application security. And security is a team sport. So what Pons is going to show you is how you, as expert on data and application, can provide the data to the security teams that you have inside your company and how you can help them to make your whole company more secure. Thank you, Martin. I'm sure Martin scared us with a lot of problems, right? And security, whenever we talk about the security, it's all about the problems. Uh, one thing I want to quickly summarize, uh, you know, the number of trailing zeros that you could read it on the slides is basically, it's a kind of a scaring us, right? So what it clearly telling us? So it clearly telling us most of the enterprises in the world follows the either knowingly or unknowingly following the strategy of security through obscurity. And day by day, the adversary is proving that security through obscurity is not going to work anymore. That's what the number says, correct? Second thing I want to highlight from Martin's uh, observation, it's not about you have a tons of money to execute your security investments. Even if you have a luxury of unlimited security budget, you still have a challenge of hiring the right talent who can help you to fight against the constant flood of security threats orchestrated by the individuals. That's not going to stop anymore. So what you need, again to summarize what Martin said, he didn't talk about only the problems alone. He did talk about the solutions as well. One orchestration across the security products with a solid set of automation capabilities. That's the way to go. With my own experience sitting in security operations center, SOC, for quite a long time, this is one of the constant questions I used to hear from my leadership team. What's our exposure to the cyber threat, let's say, for example, ransomware? They typically shoot this question as and when they hear about a new cyber threat from a media, or interestingly, whenever they hear about a hot data breach conversations across the industry, specifically whenever they hear about a conversation in their own vertical. But if you think about this question, it's not a simple question to answer. It is a fully loaded question. And interestingly, this question might come either in the mid of a night or when you are busy with your family members on a weekend. But the crux of this specific situation, your boss is going to ask you, I need the answer right now, because my boss is asking me to answer this question. So what you need is a strong set of automation capabilities that can give you the answer in a timely manner with a full of confidence. That's very much important. 
If you ask any security operations uh, center analyst, the first thing he will talk about, time is the crucial thing for me. Time is the essence. Because that money value of time is very critical for any security operations guy in the world. That's a critical thing. Now let's, let's slightly get into the SOC space. When I talk about the security operations center, Again, from my own experience, it is very hard to see any security operations center without one or the other SIM tool. Either it's a Splunk, or Curator, or ArcSight. A lot of my friends used to say that SIM is a kind of their second arm. And another interesting thing, uh, my mentor Scott is also here, you cannot see any of the security conversations without a security integration, sorry, SIM integration. SIM integration is one of the crucial stuff for a lot of security buying decisions these days. Let's talk about SIM, just to recap. SIM as a platform, as the name says, helps the security operations guy to get a context across multiple data sources. When I'm talking about data here, it's the raw events across the ecosystem, so that he should be able to triage the problems across the typical incident detection and response. And as the name says, it helps you to aggregate the data across the typical system-generated signals like a syslog and NetFlow to the level of business process data like Active Directory, like a SAP, like business data, and HR information as well. So it's a platform which collectively aggregates all the information, so you should be able to see everything from a single place. Of course, you can do a lot of customization as well. And the interesting part, whenever we talk about SIM, and whenever we talk about uh, you know, the security operations center, everyone talk, talks about the incident detection and response. But in a reality, security operations center it's not only responsible for the well-known incident detection and response. They have a broader charter across the organization's security governance and compliance that starts from compliance and reporting and insider threat to the level of fraud detection. So, so far we talked about the good things, right? If you again go back to Martin's one of the other scary thing, on an average, Security analyst triaging 200,000 security events on a daily basis. And one side, security operations center always in a hungry mode for more and more context, because that's the only way for you to respond to the security events in a, in a kind of a better way. That's a good thing. But on the other hand, if you start dumping a lot of data, you end up like hiring tons of people, that's going to shoot up your cost. So, so far we talked about a lot of scary things. What's the good news? Let's think about a scenario on top of all these already loaded security operations centers, you know, the alert fatigue. If myself and my friend Martin is going to tell you guys, go to your security operations team and ask them to accept another tons of raw events from Citrix ecosystem, I'm sure they're not going to accept it, right? So good news now. We are not talking about sending you another tens of t thousands of raw events from Citrix ecosystem. Rather, we are talking about very specifically actionable security incidents which are built based on the risk in context that your security operations team can act on it immediately. And again, take a step back to the security space. When we talk about integrating yet another system as part of your already complicated security landscape, most of you have a question, OK, uh, Martin and Ponce is going to talk about another 100 page of document which you need to go through to configure. That's going to take uh, another, few, uh, you know, another few hours or weeks. And I'm sure your IT team is not going to accept it. And we also learned enough with our own understanding from the market space. Complexity is the biggest hurdle for adopting any utility in the world. 
I'm not talking about only security. So we made it very simple. It's a matter of few seconds. You should be able to inject the risk insights, I mean actionable risk insights from Citrix, risk Citrix ecosystem, which can easily be acted upon by your security operations team. Hope you're all excited to see it in action. Just to give a context before we see it in action. For any secure communication, I'm a security guy, so I always talk about a secure, legitimate communication, you need a authentication. Second thing, you need a mechanism for you to exchange your data with a new platform. That's a plugin. That's how um, Splunk works. Then you need to configure the system so that it can receive the risk insight on an ongoing basis. That's it. It's a one-time activity, and we are going to see it in action. Now the system is going to demonstrate how simple it is to start the configuration. If I may borrow my friend uh, Matt Verge's uh, statement, it's a kind of a turnkey solution. You should be able to start pretty fast from our, you know, the data sources page. And now we are in the configuration stage. And the username is predefined by Citrix. And being a security control, you need to follow all these, uh, you know, the password regulations. And now you are ready with the configuration. We'll also send it in an email where you can keep it handy for the following steps. And now we are downloading the plugin from Citrix ecosystem. And when we talk about the configuration, the typical authentication credentials, of course, the passwords won't be here. And we talk about how you can subscribe to the topic in uh, the Kafka messaging system that we follow. And there are two ways to install the uh, add-ons, one from the Splunk base that we are still working on it. But right now, we are downloading it from the Citrix system so that you can download it as a local plugin. Now it's ready for you to configure. And once the installation done, it's pretty much straightforward where you can make the regular communication with the Citrix so that you can start getting all the risk insights. The host is the host that we already populated for, from the Citrix perspective, and the topic which, which takes care of exchanging the risk insights from Citrix to your uh, Splunk install base, if I may. There are a couple of advanced settings that you may want to configure if, um, if you have a need for that. Otherwise, we are ready to uh, start consuming the risk insights now. It's about a couple of minutes. Right now, we are validating whether the environment started getting the risk insights from Citrix. Yes, you could see all the risk insights from Citrix. You are ready to go in a couple of minutes. That's good so far. And whenever we talk about all these new additions, and the security guys' questions always is around, OK, so what for me? Right? You are dumping at another risk insights. So what's the value for me? That's the question your security operations team is going to ask you. So in another way, let's see it in action what wonders you can do by injecting the actionable risk insights from Citrix. I'm sure that's a pretty, you know, again, just to give you a context, by following the concept of defense in depth, Every company have multiple vendors. Every company have a layers of security products. And now you are going to sort of convince your security operations team to induct it in another system. Of course, we are not talking about a new system. Rather, we are asking him to get to know about a new um, risk insights, right? I'm sure your security operations team is going to shoot the same question. So what for me? Why should I, why should I uh, induct this system? Risk insights, actionable risk insights. 
Let's see it in action. What's the value that you can demonstrate for your security operations team? And on the other side, your security operations team can demonstrate the value to your executives. So let's start with the first use case. And security. Security is no more a tactical play. Day by day, security is being talked on a C-level executive suits, and everyone talks about it these days. It's not only uh, talked by the CISO, everyone talks about it these days, right? So let's talk about an interesting use case where the assets. What's the critical assets in your IT landscape? That is you and me. So let's see in action how you can use this SIM integration with the power of Citrix Risk Insights to understand the risk exposure of the most critical assets of the IT landscape. That's the users. So here we are assuming that your SIM platform already have the data from Active Directory. So we are demonstrating how you can see the view of your users' risk exposures across the different organizations or departments. And you can also see the top five risk exposures that your IT landscape is going through. And you can also get the answer for the so what. Now we are getting into the little granular view where you can understand the kind of devices used by your sales team, for example, and the kind of risk exposures your sales organization is going through. And like I said before, security is all about answering, keep answering the question of so what, right? That's the reason we keep answering the question with a lot of context that you could see it as we speak now. We talked about the organization-wide view. Then we did a drill down, basically the double click on a specific department. Now we are talking about a relative risk. If you want to understand the relative risk of your one organization, let's say the sales, with respect to what's the risk exposure my engineering organization is going through. Why? Why do you need it? Because you need to plan for the risk response as well. Risk is not about just telling you there is a problem. I need to give you actionable insights. What you need to do for that? You should be able to understand the relative risk of your one organization to other so that you can take appropriate security uh, stra you know, response. It could be a way of educating your users with the security principles or helping them to understand the kind of uh, critical assets they have access to. That's the intent of giving you the relative comparison between the organizations. Hope you are excited. Now let's, let's change the gears a little bit on the other use case. If you talk to your IT security, or in other way, asset security, the most crucial thing in an entire attack surface from their perspective is the endpoint. It's easy to say, like, in my organization, I have 100 endpoints, but I'm not sure whether it's 100 or 101 or 102, right? Those two endpoints where you don't have a visibility, that's going to be a disaster for uh, your entire security posture. So let's talk about how you can use the Citrix Risk Insights to understand the risk exposure of your IT assets. Here we are assuming that you have a data from your asset DB or CMDB, and we should be able to correlate what's the risk exposure that your IT landscape is going through across two different paradigms. One is the BYOD devices, another one is the employee-owned devices, basically the corporate assets versus non-corporate assets. You should be able to see the assets which have a risks, and you can understand the risk uh, insights over the period of time. And we are also giving you enough context so that you can easily index these risk exposures as part of your incident detection and response uh, runbook, if you will. OK. The entire industry is talking about analytics. I'm sure you, you might have the same question now. OK, what's the uniqueness from Citrix, and, Citrix Analytics? Why are we talking about here? The uniqueness is around the purpose-built machine learning models that we built specifically for the use cases that we want to address for our customers. That's the uniqueness what we have. And there is a session in the afternoon where one of my friends uh, 
Jim is going to talk about the nuts and bolts of those machine learning models. So I don't want to break the uh, surprise here. Let me uh, skip it to the next section. In a typical analytical life cycle, it spans across sense, which is nothing but I need to sense what's happening. And then I need to talk about, I need to analyze what I collected before. And then I need to respond back. I always use the term like, so what? Security is all about answering the question of, so what? It's not about just telling you there is a problem, right? It's a responsibility to help the audience to understand the implication of the problems that you're talking about. When we talk about sensing, unlike um, most of the analytical tools, they're all relied on you know, tons of agents. Some of them say stealthy agents, some of them say no agents, right? That's a different concept. So we don't have any agent reliance. Our Citrix products instrumented enough for us to collect those data. When we talk about the analyze, like I said before, we have a purpose-built machine learning models that helps us to differentiate the, you know, the anomalies. And this is the interesting part. This is very unique to Citrix. We are not just telling you like a uh, you know, handful of dashboards available across the security landscape. This is not a dashboard. This is a platform where you should be able to understand the security exposures that your attack surface is going through, and you should be able to act on it. I'll give you a classical real life example. It's not about just calling me and telling me, Ponce, there's a smoke in your house. You should also tell me, Ponce, press this button. There is a way for me to call uh, someone to fix it, right? So there has to be a way for us to help you to mitigate the problems or respond to the threats. Now let's see everything in an architectural standpoint. I'm saying maybe from Citrix uh, analytic team, I keep saying it's unique. Let's see it in action, how it works or how it you know, goes well with the architectural play of Citrix analytics. Like I said before, it's not a dashboard. It is a platform, risk assessment platform which will help you to do the real-time intervention of cyber threats before it hits your attack surface. Again, what's the uniqueness? I'll give you one, uh, my own practical experience. The traditional security operations center, they have tons of monitoring tools, but they are all completely relying on the system-generated signals like uh, syslog, NetFlow. Yeah, they all talk about packet inspection and then lateral movement and things like that. Those things works well. I'm not denying that. But now there is a huge paradigm shift with the uh, cybercrime market space. The threats no more triggered by the malwares. That's a kind of absolator. Most of the modern threats triggered by the individuals. In this case, none of those traditional security incident detection and monitoring tools can detect for a simple reason, there is no system-generated signals here. But even during the same modern-day threats, there are a lot of behavioral-related signals that you should be able to detect, and then you should be able to protect your ecosystem from those threats. But what you need is the behavioral analytical system. So we keep talking about behavioral analytics. So what do we mean by behavior? Just I want to give you another uh, thing which we learned yesterday. When we talk about the modern day threats, just I want to keep it very clear. Don't forget, tomorrow's attack is not going to be the same as today's attack. What does it mean? It's not like you can build a set of um, rules with 100 people or buy a lot of security controls and then stay away, relax. No, it's not going to work. Tomorrow's attack would be unique, and it's going to be completely different than the attacks that you know today. So what you need? You need to make sure that you have a behavioral analytics as part of your security strategy. I'll remind it again. Tomorrow's attack is not going to be the same as today. You cannot rely on the traditional rule-based security controls. That's not going to work. Like the way we are all keep innovating, cybercrime also continue to innovate. So you need to make sure that you have a one or the other behavioral analytical system 
as part of your security strategy. That's important. That's good. What do you mean by behavior? You keep talking about behavior, right? I'll try to simplify the security. I know you might laugh. Because whenever we talk about simplifying security, a lot of them used to laugh. I try to take the same example with my kids. Because security is always complex. But I always try to make it simple. What we mean by behavior? If you take your typical attack surface, right? I'm trying to simplify as much as possible. What are the typical elements in your attack surface? One is subjects, that's you and me. And very importantly, the, like people who have a privileged, you know, the access. And then, you and me trying to access something on the attack surface, which is nothing but a subject. That's it. That's a security. So far, so good. But you and me are not going to sit idle, right? We have a relationship with the objects. That's where the trouble starts. What kind of relationship? One could be access-related relationship. That's good, as long as the access relationship is in a legitimate way, like the way we have seen it a few minutes before. But not every access, be, access relationship is going to be a legitimate. And there is an activity behavior. Because after you get the access, you're trying to do something with the object. It could be a first-time first time activity, or it could be excessively you're doing something which is not supposed to be, or it could be initial behavior. So let's talk about some of the specific examples that you can understand from the Citrix analytics perspective. Again, I'm taking an example of access in context. Let's take an example where my friend, I think Martin, uh, yet to visit India. But think about a situation where, as we speak now, I could see that his identity is being used to access a confidential file, but the login attempt is being made from India. That's one. Second, the same identity is trying to keep attempting a resource, which is like a very, very confidential document in my uh, team where Martin's identity is not supposed to get access. Think about these two scenarios. Now, if you go back to my earlier annotation of so what, OK, Martin is trying to do something odd. So what for me? Isn't it a typical example of identity compromise? Let's take another example, where you could detect a lot of login failures being detected for the same identity. That's a classical example of a brute force attack. That could be a password spray or multiple ways of detecting it. So just I'm making it simple for you to understand what I'm talking about. Another scenario would be around the endpoints. So we talked about endpoints multiple times. Endpoint is the initial point of compromise that everyone bothers always. So let's assume that there is an endpoint posture failure being reported. And then the same incident shows that you know, the access is being made from a rooted device. Isn't it a classical example of an endpoint compromise? Let's talk about activity. So after I get the access, let's assume that it's a legitimate access. And I'm trying to, I'm from a sales organization, for example. I'm trying to access the source code file. That could be because, you know, because of the privileged group that I still have the access and I continue to uh, access those confidential files. Second use case where I'm trying to download a lot of files to my local disk. Isn't it a classical, you know, the indication that Ponce is trying to look out for a job and then trying to exfiltrate a data? Possible, right? Think about another scenario where, let's take my friend Martin's identity. Martin's identity is trying to access a blacklisted URL. I know Martin attends a lot of uh, DEF CON and, uh, you know, the dark web conferences. So maybe he has a lot of interest. Let's take another example where Martin's identity is trying to access a lot of risky websites where we learn that the risk exposure of those websites very high. Isn't it a classical example of uh, the specific identity is trying to do a command and control communication with a remote site after a successful exploit of the particular perimeter. Last but not the least on the specific activity behaviors, 
excessive file deletions and excessive file renaming observations, it could be a classical indication of a ransomware activity. Again, I don't want you to feel like it's all simple. I tried to make it simple so that you can understand what I'm talking about from a behavioral context. What differentiates a normal and abnormal behavior? It's very easy to say, like, there's something, you know, abnormal. That's the context. We, from Citrix, we understand the normal behavior of entire Citrix ecosystem better than anyone. So we should be able to build the models that can differentiate the normal behavior with abnormal behavior. Here are the kind of a summary across all the behavioral use cases that we cover. And let's talk about another interesting value prop that you can talk about it, right? Unlike a traditional cyber risks, insider threat has a uniqueness where you need to get a lot of data from a non-IT sources like uh, HR. That's what we are going to demonstrate here, where we took two dimensional aspect of uh, HR. One is the performance uh, decline, and then the salary um, you know, increase problems, right? So we learned that these are the typical two factors that impact the motivational aspect of an employee. So we are trying to showcase like, how it impacts someone to start doing a data exfiltration which in other way, the insider threat. Should be able to see it, we are showing you the risks, and then we are giving you a granular view of the so what question, why? Why are you saying, let's say Martin is a high risk user because he's disappointed with uh, not getting rice? Okay, just to take an example. So we are clearly, right, <laughs> so his boss is also here. Just to give an example, it clearly shows, you know, Martin is trying to access a lot of sensitive files, and then he's downloading a lot of files as well. Maybe it's a signal for his boss to start thinking about it, right? OK, maybe, um, hope it's interesting. I'll request Martin to summarize before we wrap it up for the day. OK, so thank you, everyone, for staying with us. I would like to ask you one final question, all of you. How many of you want to be responsible for security? That's perfect. And pretty much everything that we've been talking about today is we are responsible for Citrix, we are responsible for application and data. Uh, we don't have time because we are overloaded with the new Windows builds and new applications and so on. So pretty much what you can do, what Citrix Analytics allows you to do is connect your world, application and data, with the world of people like Pons that are using SIM. And I would really like to stress it out. The first demo that we showed you that took about two and a half minutes, that's pretty much how long it takes to connect all, pretty much every single Citrix product that you have with the existing security teams. So if your manager will come to you and he's going to tell you, we, we see all these security breaches, what can we do about it? You, are, you will probably do a little bit of the work. You are going to do the two-factor authentication. You are going to make sure that the Windows images are more secure, but it's only the beginning. So if you are being asked to do this, it's a really good time for you to actually talk to your security teams and tell you what you can do. Tell them, we have this solution where we can easily plug everything that we have in Citrix into your security solution, and on the way, provide it as a service Citrix can filter out the data and they can highlight whatever is considered potentially risky from a security perspective. So with that being said, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. One final thing, if you don't have yet the Tech Zone stickers, we are going to stay here for a little bit, so definitely come up front and take some of your stickers. Thank you very much. And thank you for your patience. Thank you.